Center. Um, we are so excited to have Dr. Ospino with us this morning. Um, he's been working with the Mariness. Uh, we had a retreat with him in February, where, as both of us like to say, uh, the entire world has changed since then. The topics we were talking about then, uh, we need a little grounding and refresher about where to take things forward. So I do want to uh, first, before I get into his bio, give thanks to the Visitation Mariness State community. If you're in that community, wave your hands. All these folks, their generosity has helped sponsor Dr. Ospino for today's opening keynote. Um, Dr. Hoffman Ospino was born in Colombia, where he pursued his undergraduate studies in philosophy. He taught philosophy and religion at various academic levels and worked for the National Confederation of Catholic Education of Colombia. He holds an MA in theology with a concentration in church history and a PhD in theology and education from Boston College, also my alma mater. And we had the uh, great experience of being there at a similar time. It's been fabulous to reconnect this year, and I truly am still a student watching the master at work when he speaks. His research concentrates on the dialogue between theology and culture and the impact of this interchange upon Catholic theological education, catechesis, and ministry. He's lectured nationally and internationally on these areas. He and his wife, Guadalupe, are actively involved in Hispanic ministry in Boston, he also does play a leadership role in the Encuentro gathering. So with that, over to you, Dr. Ospino. Thank you very much, uh, Katie. And uh, so it's a true pleasure to be with you this morning, you know, as part of this 2020 Lay Marianist uh, Assembly. Uh, life has its own way of challenging us and being in the midst of a pandemic. It's a challenge that perhaps most of us, you know, in our generation did not anticipate. We never see these things uh, coming. Yet here we are. We meet virtually, taking advantage of one of the greatest miracles of, in the history of humanity, which is technology. So we can see each other from different parts of the world, from different parts of, uh, of our nation at different times in, a, in, a, in our history. Nothing replaces being in person with one another and feeling the, pres the presence of a friend or a colleague next to us, hearing our voices in our room, in a room full of people, or stretching our hand or greeting one another with a big hug. Life will eventually allow us the opportunity to return to, to, the, to these practices. What is not over, however, is the possibility of being together. Yes, in different ways. What is not over is the ability that we have to continue to be in relationship with one another, to engage in conversation, and to be present to one another. During the last few months, many have used the expression social distancing. I believe that this category is inaccurate. What has taken place is rather physical distancing, but our, our ability to relate socially, spiritually, and, and ecclesially actually has increased, grown exponentially. We miss one another, and that is good. We miss the warmth and the presence of, one, of the other, and that is also good. We miss praying and worshiping together, and that's very good. We are finding now fresh and creative ways to be present to one another, to be in communication, and most importantly, to be church. We are discovering, perhaps, already discovering fresher and even more dynamic ways of engaging in the ministry of accompaniment. There are many lessons to be learned from our current experience. I want to express my profound, my most profound gratitude to all the organizers of this uh, assembly. And in particular, I want to acknowledge the leadership and work of uh, Katie. We were together, as she said earlier, at the end of February with a group of Marianist sisters, brothers, priests, and lay leaders in California at a workshop that was organized by the Office of Education for the Marianist province of the US. For two days, 
we engaged in conversation about some of the demographic and cultural trends that are redefining Catholicism in the United States, with particular attention to the growing presence of Hispanic Catholics. Part of my presentation today, as a matter of fact, will draw from some of those insights shared at the workshop in order to have some common language among the different members of the Marianist family. However, as again, as Katie was indicating, what we planned four months ago is much different from what we are gonna, we are reflecting today. The title of this reflection is Feeling the Pulse, American Catholicism in a Time of Change. I chose this title inspired in the image of a beating heart. Catholicism in the US is going through major transformations, demographic, cultural, ecclesiological, and even socioeconomic. The current pandemic will likely accelerate some of these transformations and add a new set of challenges. Now, it is tempting very tempting to look at these changes and transformations that are redefining the you know, Catholic life in this country with a sense of pessimism. For many Catholics, a lot has been lost and they mourn. Some have decided to live in the midst of all these dynamics. Others have embraced a spirit of resistance, even retrenchment, and want to return to a glorified past that perhaps never existed. Remember, each historical moment comes with its own challenges. Other Catholics may feel confused, adrift, out of place, awaiting some guidance from their leaders, yet trusting that God has not abandoned us. Many other Catholics, millions in fact, see these changes in transformation as opportunities. Young people, immigrants, educators, evangelizers, missionaries, among many others. We trust that the Holy Spirit continues to guide the church, especially in tumultuous times. It is precisely because, of, because the Holy Spirit continues to guide the church in the here and now of our lives that there is a beat. And as long as there is a beat, there is life. Our role as baptized women and men who are in relationship with Jesus Christ is to read the signs of the times. That's what the Second Vatican Council invited us to do read the signs of the times, and we do so with the eyes of faith, and we do it using the instruments that are available to us, whether it's sciences, whether it's the tradition, whether it's the faith resources, rituals, and practices that we have. We have an obligation, trusting in that same Holy Spirit, to take the pulse of what is happening in the created order, the world, our society, our particular communities, and our own lives. As we do this, we can plan better our ministries and be leaven of hope for a world that longs for joyful, passionate, and merciful witnesses of the gospel. Feeling the pulse of Catholicism in the United States is not something that one person can do alone. Neither it is something that one can do in just a few minutes, no? So I'm being ambitious in this particular talk. Feeling the pulse of our church must be an exercise of communal discernment. We must listen. We must listen to our own interior lives, the way we read reality, the way we understand reality, but we must listen to one another. We must listen to what is going on in our societies. We must listen to what is happening around us and in the world. We must inform ourselves. We must have an open mind. We must trust. What I wanna do in this reflection is model 
something that you can do and must do in your communities, ministries, and organizations. My premise is very simple. Every challenge carries in itself a set of opportunities. Every challenge carries in itself a set of opportunities. If we are able to name the challenge, sometimes with prophetic voice, sometimes with humility, then the opportunities will surface with an element of clarity. And with the, those, and, and with, and as those opportunities emerge, then we will be able to respond with creativity. Everybody needs to be engaged in this conversation. One cannot understand the U.S. Catholic experience without taking a closer look at the realities that shape our lives as citizens and or members of this society. In other words, we need to understand what is happening in the U.S. as a country in order to envision better ways to build a church and share the gospel with others. With this in mind, I want to take a closer look at four challenging realities and the opportunities that each challenge brings for Catholic ministerial leaders today. Challenge number one, shifting attitudes toward religion in public life and the growth of secularism. There is no doubt that the United States of America is a pluralistic society. From its very beginnings, we have seen ourselves as a country, as a nation, where pluralism is at the center of our self-identity, of who we are. However, not long ago, that pluralism was also defined by the conviction that we were primarily a Christian nation, that we were primarily a Protestant nation, but that's been changing, particularly in the last 50, 60 years. We are a pluralistic society in terms of religious perspectives. There is a growing awareness also that churches are not monolithic. Not all Catholics are the same or stand, the same issue, stand, stand for the same issues in the same manner. As a matter of fact, as philosopher Charles Taylor insists, there's not such a thing as one Catholicism. There are multiple Catholicisms that share in the same values, common values, core Catholic uh, parameters of identity, yet the way those parameters inform life in the everyday change depending on the circumstances and the realities that shape the lives of those that are embracing such values. There is no such a thing, for instance, in this time of elections, in, in this time of political upheaval, there is no such a thing as a Catholic vote or a Catholic unified voice in the public square. The same applies to other religious groups. There is no such a thing as one way of being a Jew or a Muslim or a Buddhist or even an atheist or an agnostic or a non-religious, uh, religiously affiliated person. At the grassroots of, our, of what's happening in church and society, religion is definitely perceived as a private individual affair. The separation of church and state in the United States of America at the grassroots level has largely been interpreted and continues to be interpreted as a separation of faith, you no know, private faith or pa pa uh, private life in public, in public life. However, at the level of leadership, religious leaders in recent decades have been more proactive engaged and associated with public and, 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 uh, and political conversations. How close? That is a question that we need to ask. For some commentators, far too close. 
for others not close enough. But what is certain is that there is a Catholic obligation, there is a, there is a Christian obligation to participate and to get engaged in the affairs of our society. In the midst of this pluralism, we have seen the large increase of secularization, and this particularly in the last 40 years. The United States of America until the year 1990, 1991, was primarily identified as a Christian nation, nation even though there's been uh, diversity in, ter in terms of religious. In the early 1990s, only 6% of the U.S. population self-identified as non-religiously affiliated, although the term, the category sociologically is a little bit more recent. Today, in 2020, as we start heading into the third decade of the 21st century, 25% of the U.S. population self-identifies as non-religiously affiliated. Many of them are former Catholics. Most of these people who are the so-called N-O-N-E-S, nuns, are young and young adult people in the end of our nation. Why is this important for us as we look into the future? Because as the share of the secularized population increases in our, in our society, there will be major effects in public life. There will be effects in the terms of how in terms of how our society shapes and affirms value and how the role of religion is defined in light of those values as well as its participation and there will be also an impact in terms of how faith-based organizations can interact or will be allowed to interact uh, in a society that is increasingly secularized. There's no problem with having secular voices. As a matter of fact, that's one of the characteristics of Western modern societies. The coexistence of secular voices alongside with religious voices and other, you know, other ways of understanding, understanding reality. But what is troublesome is the growing influence of militant anti-religious voices in educational institutions, the media, government, in other instances of our life as society. Now, we could go into an entire conversation and analysis about why that militant spirit has increased you know, in, in our society and what goes behind, what are some of the, the principles, but I just want to name it as part of this, of this particular reflection. We also need to ask why so many millions of former Catholics now self-identify as totally secularized and why many see themselves now as non-religiously affiliated. Where was the breakdown? Where did we fail? What is it that they did not find appealing so they could stay in the Catholic Church, in the Catholic, in, in, in the, in the Catholic tradition? But as I said, every challenge comes with a new set of opportunities. And among the opportunities that this challenge of pluralism and secularism brings for, all, for us as Roman Catholics is the unique opportunity to engage in the many conversations that are emerging in our society. We need to be part of those conversations with new voices, with new manners of, en of engagement, retrieving traditions that perhaps have not been highlighted enough. But this is an opportunity for us to bring what we have into the marketplace of ideas. Long or gone are the days when we could simply assume that because we were Christian or because we were Roman Catholic, we had a place at the table. We must justify those voices. And that requires creativity, and that requires a level of sophistication that leaders, for instance, in groups like the Marianist family, 
those working in universities, those working in schools, those working in, in ministry have developed in all, uh, uh, over the years. One of the areas where we, can, where, where we have a unique opportunity to engage these conversations is through Catholic media. However, I wanna make a parenthesis here and express a major concern that I have about the role in what is happening with Catholic media in the United States of America. Two major phenomena associated with Catholic media. On the one hand, there is an increased polarization in Catholic media that caricaturizes what it means to be Catholic in this nation. So we have Catholic media that self-identifies as progressive, Catholic media that self-identifies as conservative or traditional, and there is very little room for anything in between. So the two positions in Catholic media, whether it's newspapers or television or radio, some, some, uh, on a regular basis, appear as antagonistic as, uh, you know, to each other, yet more in sync with the larger polarization about which I will speak uh, in a second. The second phenomenon associated with Catholic media is the shrinking of opportunities for Catholic media that we see in the United States of America. The United States of America, the church in the United States of America was one of the richest sources of Catholic media, not only for, for Catholics in the country, but for the entire world. But in the last 20 years, particularly, although this is not new, we have seen a process of closing Catholic newspapers a galore, diocesan papers closing, or going from weekly or biweekly um, publication to monthly publication or simply disappearing. Mergers, Catholic magazines disappearing, radio programs disappearing, te television uh, uh, shrinking at the same time, and we are beginning to also see in the last, particularly in the last two, three decades, the rise of Catholic conglomerates, many of them uh, associated with ideological trends. No? That's a reason for concern, and we need to see or ask ourselves, if we want to be part of these conversations, how do we do it? What, you know, what can we do uh, from our own universities, from our own uh, families, you know, spiritual families, as we move forward. Close parenthesis. There is a new wave also of ecumenical and interreligious uh, inter dialogue. As our society becomes increasingly diverse and pluralistic vis-a-vis -vis religion, we have a unique opportunity to uh, engage in this uh, in, in, in new forms of ecumenical and interreligious uh, dialogue. Uh, earlier in this, um, uh, we, we began this this moment to this morning with a with a prayer that involved uh, remembering the fifth anniversary of Laudato Si. It is opportunities like this, you no know, uh, conversations about the created order that allow us to actually engage with other uh, members of. Uh, religious traditions, no, and even non-religious traditions on common themes. But we also need to keep in mind that much of the ecumenical dialogue in the United States of America that Catholics have advanced, it has been advanced by white Catholics, and it has been done primarily with, uh, with uh, pro uh, traditional Protestant churches. There's a unique opportunity to invite Latinos Asians, black uh, and black Catholics, and other Catholics, whether immigrants or US born who have not been engaged in these conversations to embrace this type of uh, ecumenical and interreligious dialogue. Very few voices from these groups, yet we cannot allow, we cannot lower the guard in that regard. There are new spaces to do theology. This pluralism that I have been describing somehow creates new spaces to do, to do theology and to do evangelization. Pope Benedict XVI spoke about 
the new courts that are available in our world, the courts of the Gentiles he would speak about, you no? Know? These are the places where women and men of our day are having conversations where they are defining the values that determine the direction of a particular society. And according to Pope Benedict XVI, we cannot, as Roman Catholics, be absent from those courts, from those, from those conversations, whether they are happening in social media, in academic settings, in political, in, in political um, uh, spaces, we need to be part of those conversations. And finally, we need uh, this situation, the, the challenge of uh, increasing secularism and pluralism, also invites us into self-examination. We need to ask ourselves, what is it that young people are not seeing and finding in the Catholic Church as structured today? So they decide to move on to other traditions or secularization. It is estimated that more than 30 million Catholics in this country have moved away from Catholicism, or former Catholics, have moved away from this religious tradition in the last three or four decades. That is scandalous. That is scandalous. And that involves uh, former Catholics you know, who are white, Hispanic, Asian, Black, every ethnic tradition. We need to have a, make a, a major self-examination in that regard. I once asked a colleague of mine in the School of Business, at, you know, and uh, I, I asked them, why, uh, what would happen if a CEO of a company or, or a company you know, that you advise were to lose um, 30 million customers or clients? And my colleague did not hesitate to say the entire leadership would go. That's pretty much telling, you know? So we need to find ways to ask ourselves, I'm not asking here for the entire leadership to go, but we need to hold each other as leaders because we are leaders, lay, ordained, vowed, religious. We all are leaders and that's why we are here. We need to hold ourselves accountable. Challenge number two, demographic and cultural changes redefining the US Catholic experience. Catholicism in this country has been engaged in a long, long period of demographic transformation. No, and this is not the first time that it happens. The first Catholics in this country, as we all know, as a matter of fact, were Hispanic. You know, they, they, they came from Spain. First uh, practices of Catholicism in this country were practices that were led by Hispanics, by you know, Spanish and by, the, by, by French Catholics. In the 19th century, we see this you know, upsurge of uh, immigrants from Europe and eventually their children integrate into, into the life of, of the church. By the 1960s, most Roman Catholics in this country were white Euro-American, English speaking, and the descendants of those immigrants from, uh, from Europe. Yes, there were Latino Catholics, and yes, there were black Catholics and a few Asian Catholics, but unfortunately, they were on the margins. They remained in the peripheries. Today, we have not, that situation is reversing, is shifting around. And now the fastest growing groups in the Catholic Church in this country are Hispanics and Asians. As a matter of fact, Asians are the fastest, fastest growing group in the Catholic Church, although their numbers are much smaller but the Latino community is transforming entirely the, the, the entire Catholic landscape in this country. And we are beginning to see a major influx of Catholics from Africa arriving in this, uh, in this country. We are gonna see in the future more Catholics from the Middle East also arriving in this nation. So we are literally transitioning from a mostly Euro-American white English speaking experience to a largely or to a very diverse demographically, ethnic, racially, linguistically, culturally experience and with a certain pre predominance of the Latino community. About 43% of all Catholics in the United States of America are Hispanic. 
then Hispanics are a very young population. You know, the median age of uh, Latinos is 29. About half of all Hispanics in this country are younger than 25. That gives you a sense of the potential of, 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 the, of this group. Two thirds of Latinos, give or take, are self-identify as Roman Catholic, less than 60%, actually, according to a recent uh, study by Pew. But still, you know, almost 60% is, is a huge percentage of this population. We know that in the United States, about 60% of all Catholics under the age of 18 are Hispanic. So now what we see here is a, a unique opportunity for us to reinvent ourselves, to, for, for us to reinvent, uh, re, reinvent uh, ourselves. Now, but we also need to keep in mind that this transition is not only cultural or demographic, or uh, um, sorry, cultural or, uh, or uh, ethnic and racial. It is also a socioeconomic transition. Most white Catholics in this country, adult white Catholics, have a college degree, a four-year college degree. 55% of white Catholic adults hold a bachelor's degree or something superior, something beyond, uh, beyond a bachelor's degree. Compare that to the largest group in, right now at the, in, in the Catholic Church uh, uh, that is growing, which is Latinos. Only 16% of adult Latinos has a college degree. 84% of Latinos do not have that level of education. And many of them, as a matter of fact, work in blue collar jobs. That eventually, as the Latino community increases and the white Euro American community decreases and ages, fifth, the average age of white Catholics in this country is 55. No? So that pretty much tells us that in 20 years, about two thirds of all Catholics in the US are going to be Latinos. Why? Simply, uh, the, uh, the, the main reason is the, the, the how young Latinos are, and two, um, the rate at which you know, white Catholics are aging, but the very few numbers at the, uh, you know, in, the, in the younger years. So the impact is going to be big as we move forward, you know, as we move, uh, we move into the 21st century with an increasingly Hispanic church and the challenges that we have. Uh, one of the challenge, a part of this challenge is that uh, even though it seems obvious that we should be embracing Latinos and Asians and uh, uh, immigrants from Africa who are Roman Catholic into our churches and our communities and rejoicing for their presence, the truth is that that's not happening, unfortunately, in many corners of, of the Catholic Church, in many of our ministries, in many of our, uh, uh, of our institutions. What, I, you know, what, what, what we are beginning to see, or what we are seeing for, for a quite a while, is resistance. Not, in not only resistance, but also lack of attention to those new voices. What are some of the opportunities, then, that this challenge brings? On the one hand, one of the biggest opportunities that we have as the church becomes increasingly diverse is that the rich life and experiences and traditions that immigrant Catholics have and bring are an opportunity to renew, to renovate, to renew what it means to be Catholic in this country. Popular religion, new spiritualities, young people, fresher ways of doing, uh, of, the, of, of living Catholic life. But if we continue to marginalize those uh, experiences, we are going to actually limit ourselves in our potential growth. Another opportunity is take advantage, embrace and engage Hispanic youth. Hispanic youth are the present and the future of Catholicism in the United States. We cannot ignore the potential contribution of Latino young people one of the challenges that we have is that we need to educate them, but they are not present in our institutions, unfortunately. Only, just barely, 4% of Hispanic Catholic children are uh, enrolled in, uh, who are school age, are enrolled in Catholic schools. Barely 11% of all the students in Catholic colleges and universities, or, or students, 
actually all students in Catholic college and university are Hispanic. So we got a long way to go, but we are not gonna give up. We cannot give up. We have that opportunity. And as we transition socioeconomically, at some point, the church in the United States, and, I, and this is something that uh, a lot of people that I have engaged in conversation don't like to hear, but we have to recognize that the church in this country has grown far too accustomed to being a middle upper class church, you no know, concerned about, uh, about the questions of the middle upper class communities. Nothing wrong with that. But we cannot forget those at the bottom of the social scale, those in the peripheries, those in the margins, no? So as the Latino community, the Asian community, the African communities uh, continue to grow in the United States of America, and we you know the number of resources, and, and I, when I say resources, I mean financial, I, may, I, I mean parishes and schools, potentially universities, decreases in this country, we are going to find ourselves to be, you know, with a unique po possibility of being a poor church serving the poor. This, the 21st century is going to be an exciting way to be Catholic in the United States of America. And certainly COVID-19 is going to push us a little bit more in, in, in that direction. So for those of you who are ready to do missionary work, this is your time. Challenge number three ideological polarization and the erosion of institutional credibility. And I'm not gonna spend much time on this because I have already touched upon a few, but I just wanna provide a, a, a framework. Yes, ideological polarization is tearing our communities, our families apart. This divide, this divide, uh, left, right, conservative, liberal, progressive, traditional, and on and on and on, is something that violates, violates the essence of what it means to be Christian. It violates, violates the idea of being a family sustained by the faith in Jesus Christ with one father, you know, God the Father. The culture wars, the culture wars that define the United States of America and have defined the United States of America particularly since the 1960s. Not that they are new. As a matter of fact, there have been always culture wars throughout history, but the ones that we have seen, we are seeing right now are undermining our profound sense of community. Let me say it in, ecclesi in ecclesiological terms. We, our communion is wounded by ideological polarization. And as such, our institution continues to lose credibility. Polarization leads to social, political, and religious dysfunctionality. We are already seeing this in Congress. We see this in many of our churches. We're seeing it in some of our universities. That institutional credibility in recent years, particularly in the last couple of uh, decades, has been undermined you know, or has been has increased as a matter of fact institutional lack of institutional credibility has been undermined by clerical sexual abuse you no know, and its effects we continue to hear about cases that are reported you know uh, on on something that occurred in the past but there are always we continue to uncover new and new and, and more cases for two decades the church continues to to deal with this uh, many pastoral leaders in this process of ideological polarization are perceived to be uninformed about what is happening in the lives of people at the grassroots, and not only uninformed, but also aloof and disinterested in what is happening in the lives of young people, what is happening in the lives of women, in the lives of communities that are marginalized, in the lives of communities of color, no? It is, uh, it is interesting to see how our own Catholic Church, for instance, during this time of uh, COVID-19 or you know, the, the, the movement uh, Black Lives Matter, movements against uh, racial violence, many of our, the many leaders in our church, you know, beginning with bishops, clergy, uh, vowed religious, lay leaders, all of us, including college professors and so on, how many of us 
have remained silent, have remained aloof, have remained on the margins and in silence. We are becoming complicit in those dynamics with that particular silence. So Catholicism, friends, Catholicism runs the risk, you know, in light of this challenge, of becoming irrelevant, irrelevant in the eyes of society, and more dangerously, irrelevant in the eyes of the younger generations. So what are the opportunities for, for that? At the heart of Christianity and at the heart of Catholicism exists a theology of inclusiveness that builds upon the conviction that the world is a sacred place where God is active. So to be Catholic is to look at reality with a both-end mentality, a both-end outlook, rather than an either-or attitude that often, not, that often defines who we are as citizens or as people, you know, women and men living in the United States of America. It is a both-end mentality, and we must retrieve that as part of what we do. We need to go beyond labels. We must, we, we, we are uniquely positioned to transcend those labels. We are neither progressive or conservative or associated with one, with one political party or the other. Our starting point is we are Christian. We are disciples of Jesus Christ. And for, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we read the reality, we en, en, enter, the rea, enter it in, in dialogue with his reality. One opportunity that we have is that this is a time to recognize our weaknesses. This is a time in which we can present ourselves as a wounded church, as a wounded community that relies on mercy and models of reconciliation in order to build community. Gone is the triumphant church. Gone is the church that wants to be enmeshed in politics. Gone is the church that wants to live out of favors and sell its soul or some leaders to sell you know, uh, their soul for a few favors, whether political or economic or, so, or social. This is a time to build community as a church that is wounded. We need humility in a return to the gospel or as a theologian, Jose Antonio Pagola from Spain says, it is a time to return to Jesus Christ. We need to understand ourselves as pilgrims and challenge any assumption of being an established static community at the service of whatever system is in place. We must reclaim our prophetic and missionary identities as Christians. In challenge number four, there are multiple pandemics shaking basic assumptions about who we are as American and as Catholic. Obviously, COVID-19, you know, is a, which is a pandemic of uh, global proportions, comes to mind. This is a pandemic that, you know, although it transcends colors, social status, educational levels, everything, everybody is vulnerable before the virus, no, we, no, the coronavirus, no, we know that it is disproportionately affecting the most vulnerable in our society. The elderly, the poor, the sick, the imprisoned, minoritized communities. We really have to read Matthew chapter 25 once again about this you know, with the eyes of what's happening with COVID-19. COVID-19 has been revealing the fissures and inadequacies of our government at the national, state, and local levels. COVID-19 is raising questions about underlying realities in our society, such as access to health care, housing, just wages, child care, among others. Are we re really a society established under the principle of democracy is a question that we need to ask. And if so, what exactly is our democracy? One question that is emerging right now as we are affected is, will our churches and schools and Catholic ministries survive this pandemic? La uh, earlier this week, 
the Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate released the reports of a survey of Catholic bishops in the United States in which they were asked how they were dealing with, the, the, with, with this particular pandemic. And one of the biggest concerns of the bishops is financial. No, without finances, offices, ministries, schools may close. But one bishop in, in, the, in the qualitative part of the essay asked one question that I think you know, is perhaps one of the most uh, moving questions and the ones that you know, uh, stick up, uh, uh, sticks up uh, from this uh, report. Will Catholics return to our churches? The, what, the, 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 the easy answer should be, why not? But I guess that it is a valid question given the state of affairs. Besides COVID-19, we got others, other pandemics you know, in, in our society. We got COVID-1619, as some commentators are using, which deal with the racism and racial violence, white supremacy in our society. So this racism continues to affect who we are, continues to affect how we define ourselves as a society. But there is also the pandemic of anti-immigrant movements, movements of xenophobic movements. There are aporophobic movements, aporophobia, meaning fear or hate of those who are poor. The way we are treating immigrants and refugees or simply rejecting them, especially those who are poor. Among the opportunities that this challenge brings, we got, you know, we have to recognize that Roman Catholics cannot be absent from these conversations. We need to bring the best of our Catholic social, Catholic intellectual tradition and Catholic so social teaching into it. This is a time to shine. We need prophets. And as prophets, we need spaces for those voices to be heard. Where do we Catholics stand in this conversation? Where do our leaders stand when it comes to racism and immigration and the care for the, for, for the weakest and the care for those who are struggling the most? There cannot be polarization here. There can only be inspiration from the gospel. These are crucial questions. And we must reinvent how our structures uh, and, uh, and organizations are working in order to respond to the effects of these pandemics. We need new ministries, the Ministry of Advocacy, the Ministry of Protest. We need the Ministry of Reconstructing Society. To conclude, my hope is that this brief analysis offers a framework for your discernment as you envision ways to continue to advance your ministries. My intention here is not to paint a bleak picture, yet we must understand that these are not normal times. If there ever, there are ever normal times. There may be moments in history when societies and churches, you know, enjoy some level of stability. These, right now, I think are moments of transition, adjustment, change, yet moments of growth. Growing demands, being attentive to the opportunities that emerge as we read and discern reality. Growing demand, growing means leaving behind that which is not working or that which holds us back as we allow God's reign to become present in our lives. This is what Pope Francis calls pastoral, conversion pastoral, pastoral conversion. I believe that we are privileged to live in this particular time of history in which something new is being born. We have a few choices. One, we can ignore what is happening and hide in our little corners, churches, families, groups, institutions, refusing to look at the larger picture and choose to be distracted by our own concerns. Two, resist the, cha the changes and despair because things do not go our way. Or three, Confront the challenges at hand and embrace the opportunities that they bring, trusting that God walks with us and that the Holy Spirit is leading the way. I choose the third option. So my dear friends, let us entrust our discernment to Mary, our mother and intercessor, particularly in her advocation as Our Lady of Guadalupe, mother of the new creation. She encouraged Juan Diego, her son, her chosen one, to bring a message of hope to his people at a time of many challenges, yet a time that birthed a new moment in this continent. May through her intercession, we have the courage to bring a message of hope to our sisters and brothers 
as we forge together a new moment for our church and our nation. Thank you very much. Good. Okay, thank you so much. We're gonna try something here. We're gonna try to unmute everyone and let you clap and say thank you for everybody. A round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, let's remute. Um, we are going to open up the chat. So it is, um, I, I apologize, I forgot to let everyone know, close the chat during our speakers today so that we can really focus on the learning. Um, I do want to allow folks to ask a couple of questions and um, Dr. Ospino, I'll point you to the chat box. There's a thing starting to pop up there that you might want to take a look at. Um, but the first uh, note that I'm seeing there is just noting that the demographics of our own Mariness community. We definitely, um, this is a reflection from Rob that we match that middle class group you describe and not the coming demographics. So do you want to say anything more about particular um, advice you would give to the Mariness? We also obviously have schools and institutions, and I know you're passionate about um, encouraging us to look at how we admit, especially Hispanic youth, to school age and the university level. Yes, I mean, the, the, I'll just say a couple of uh, uh, br uh, brief things in regards to that. Yes, there are sectors of our, uh, uh, of our country and our nation and even our ministries where those demographic transitions that I'm seeing you know, are not as obvious, evident as, uh, you know, for instance, if you were in Texas or you were in uh, California or Florida or Louisiana, et cetera. So my, uh, my, the, the suggestion that I always have is, you know, we, we don't have to wait until the demographic uh, population, uh, transitions begin we need to start educating those who, with whom we work about what is happening. In a sense, we need to, start, you know, we cannot be like the, you know, have education like the like ostriches, you know, only looking at our little holes and little corners, but we need to start expanding people's imagination. I recently gave a talk, you know, in which I was talking about a, 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 a brief study on some Catholic universities, you know, that revealed that you know, a significant percentage of students who arrive at Catholic universities, particularly at elite univer Catholic universities, do, have never met or lived or engaged a black person, you know, or a Latino person. That says a lot about how we, ha we uh, are isolated ourselves and segregated in our society. So the question is, how do we actually integrate all these matters or these changes into the curriculum so when they happen in our main note, when they happen, our ministries, our teaching will be more engaging. Great. Um, there's another question coming in about the growing number of Hispanic evangelicals. Um, the actual question is how do we keep them? But I thought it might be a nice platform to talk a little bit about your work with Encuentro um, and any other topics you wanna to cover in that space. So, so the question is how do we keep people who are going, Latinos who are going to the evangelicals? Oh my yeah. goodness, well, you, you know, that, so, something to keep in mind is that uh, that theory has been debunked, you know? Uh, we know that about, uh, just give or take, 16 to 20 million Hispanics uh, in this country are former Catholics. And there is a, there is, and this is something, this is a fantasy that some, so, so many of us actually got, you know, maybe a, a nice priest at some point just posted and then we bought it, bought into it, or, or a sociologist or something. But uh, the, the vast majority, the vast majority of Latinos who stop self-identifying as Roman Catholic do not become evangelicals, do not become mainstream Protestant, do not become Muslim, do not become something else. The most, the vast majority about 80% become secularized. Many of them become simply non-religiously affiliated and down the road end up being secularized. That's the biggest challenge. That's why I, I was saying that we need to do this. Um, in terms of the Fifth Encuentro, I think that uh, what the Fifth Encuentro did was you know, for four years, you know, it allowed us to take the polls of Catholicism in this country and see you know, how the church is responding. And I mean, and there are encouraging, very encouraging uh, signs that 
no, the institutional church is becoming more and more aware. But there are also signs of concern, and I'm gonna mention two. Uh, just across the board, we are doing a very poor job engaging Hispanic youth. Very poor job engaging Hispanic youth. And remember, 60% of Catholics under 18 are, are Hispanic. We are not engaging them in our schools, our universities, catechetical programs, youth ministry programs. We are literally dropping the ball in, the, in, in that sense. You know, we're, we're gonna lose that population and that would mean we're endangering the future of, of, uh, of Catholicism in many ways. The other concern is that the number of Latinos in positions of leadership you know, in the Catholic Church continues to be very small. Very few Hispanic bishops, very few Hispanic priests, very few Hispanic sisters, very few Hispanic college pro, you know, presidents of Catholic colleges, very few Hispanic theologians, very few Hispanic everywhere. Just name the category and the number of Latinos is very small. So we really need to start shifting our attention to leadership in the Latino community. Um, I'm going to combine two questions here. One is just the basic question, uh, what as laity can we do to advance your ideas? And then it kind of speaks to the fact that leadership doesn't reflect our demographics either. And that the, another question, the bis bishops seem unwilling to enter into dialogue about what's happening in our country. So can you, I know you talk um, explicitly about how you think we should look to the bishops or not and what laity can do. Yeah, I, uh, my, I would say, you know, in, in terms of, uh, of the laity, uh, one, we need to inform ourselves. We need an educated laity. And, uh, and doesn't matter if you are white, Hispanic, Black, Asian, Native American, you know, your background, immigrant or US born, we all have an obligation to inform ourselves and do something, I mean, just as simple as that. You know, we need to start in our little corners trying to make, to, to make uh, our difference. Start a discussion group, for instance. Write, you know, write, write. I would like to see more, more people writing about, this, uh, about these matters. Now, uh, are, uh, are the bishops uh, and other leaders, you know, and that includes universities and that includes organizations uh, willing and ready to talk about these matters? I see, glimpses you know of hope you know there are many of them i want to highlight for instance the work that the bishop uh, from el paso bishop sites is doing on matters of immigration which is amazing you know or uh, i want to look at you know for instance what bishop uh, the bishop from um, uh, my goodness uh, archbishop uh, wilton gregory in washington you know talking about questions of race using that big pulpit, you know, the, the, or bullet pul pulpit, as we would say, um, uh, in Washington, D.C. I think that we need more of these bishops, you know, uh, and eventually, I, you know, I see Bishop Jose Gomez being more outspoken about immigration as well, and I want them to keep doing that, but do it even more emphatically. I also like Cardinal, uh, um, the, uh, Cardinal from, uh, from uh, Newark, uh, Tobin, you know, who, I mean, his work with immigrants and he, he's very outspoken. I think that, that this is a time to be outspoken, but don't wait for the bishops, don't wait for the theologians, don't wait for the college presidents, you know, start where you are in your little communities. All right, that's about all the time we have. Any following parting thoughts for us as we enter the day? You've got one minute. I am thrilled to be with you and thank you for all your work, your commitment. God bless you in all that you're doing and I'm pretty sure that life will bring us together at some point, if not virtually, you know, you know ideally physically. Yes, thank you so much. Bye, and I do want to note there's many more questions in the chat box. Um, we obviously cannot get to all the questions, but it's great to see everyone engaging, um, popping up their favorite quotes and popping up just for all of us here, one of the things that I love you said is that we're here because we're leaders. So in some ways we have the talent already in the room here and we can look to each other to begin to explore these deeper questions, look for things that are working and see how we might scale those solutions into more broad um, geographies across the Marinus family. So many, many thanks to you, Dr. Ospino. We look forward to being in touch in the future and blessings on your work this year and re-entering um, school under these many pandemics. Thank you Thank so you. much. Okay. With that,